Uh, now, before I get into the assembly, uh, I do the Remembrance Sem Assembly every single year. I'm joined this year by this wonderful display made by Year 7 and 8 art students from Miss Willits' class. And I think it just serves to underline how important uh, re uh, remembrance is just that we've got this wonderful display. So a massive thank you to all the students in Year 7 and 8 art Miss Willits' class who've helped make that wonderful display there. Okay, as I said, I do the Remembrance Assembly every single year. <coughs> this year, there's something extra special, extra important about it. Now, I know a lot of you in the room know what that is already. If you don't, then don't panic. That's what we're going to be going through in this assembly. So the First World War has been going on, or was going on for four years. It was 100 years ago uh, on Sunday that it finished. And over the last four years at Colton Hills, in each of the assemblies, we've been looking at something that was taking place in the year of the First World War. So in 2014, it was 100 years since the First World War started, and we were looking at things uh, from the very beginning of the war. And so on, uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, and up to this year, 2018, of course, that's 100 years, the centenary, 100 years since the First World War finished. And the concept of remembrance really began at that time. So, 1918, 2018, 100 years since the end of the First World War. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this assembly. Now you've got to be quite eagle-eyed to be able to spot the date on that newspaper there. But if you look really, really closely, you can see it says Tuesday, November 12th, 1918. Now we know that Remembrance Day, every single year, it's always the same, is the 11th day of the 11th month, the 11th of November. So this newspaper front page is for the day after that. And in, this, uh, in these pictures we can see the different ways that people wanted to celebrate the fact that the war had finished. We've got people climbing on a bus and waving the Union Jack, the British flag. We've got people climbing on taxis, a soldier in an embrace there. And a child, I don't know much about that child, but I would estimate they're younger than four, which means that that child knows nothing other than war. Uh, so, the end of the First World War, 1918, a hundred years ago, people wanted to celebrate in this kind of way. Now I think it's important we go through a few of the reasons why the ordinary people back home in Britain, why they wanted to celebrate. So here we are. A simple list. I won't necessarily read through all of those points, but this is the reason why the people in those previous pictures, why they wanted to celebrate so much. Why they, they wanted to go and see the king on the balcony at Buckingham Palace, and why there were huge crowds celebrating. All of those things, this is just for the ordinary people back home in Britain let alone the soldiers who were fighting in the, in the trenches in the First World War, but some of these things, it's quite easy to kind of to experience or measure the difference. So for example, you had to pay higher taxes. Uh, everyone had to pay higher taxes during the First World War. Now, once the war is finished, people had to pay less. So you can see the difference there. You can see the change. Uh, less food, you can, you can kind of, everyone can understand or relate to what it's like to be a little bit more hungry. But the one thing that I always think is really, really difficult, the last two bullet points for us to empathise with, uh, fear of attack or invasion. Now Britain wasn't invaded during World War II, but that doesn't mean that people weren't scared that it might happen. Britain was attacked, of course it was attacked much more with the Blitz in World War II, but Britain was damaged and attacked in the First World War, and people were worried about it, and they were stressed, and sometimes they weren't sleeping properly. And we know that if you don't sleep properly and if you're stressed, that can have other damaging health effects for you. But the last bullet point, that's perhaps the most difficult one to measure. Now, for four years there were people worried that a loved one, whether it's their dad, their brother, their son, or whoever it may be, even just a friend, they might get the news that that person has died fighting in the First World War, that tomorrow might be the day when they get that letter in the post to say the information, the tragic news of that person has died. So for four years, people had to put up with all of those things. And that's why, when it finished in 1918, we had scenes like this. People wanted a big party. And the story goes that, kind of connected with this picture, the story goes that after three days of celebrating and partying, the police actually had to be called. And the police turned up at different parties and said, yes, it's great that, we've, that the war is over, um, but yeah, we're all happy, but sooner or later we do have to go back to work. 
So the police had to be called to loads of different parties to say, back to work everyone, yes we're pleased, yes we're relieved, but life must go on. So these people, they were upset, supposed their party had to end. But partying wasn't necessarily what everyone wanted to do. These gentlemen in this picture, of course they're relieved that the First World War has finished, but they don't want to party, they don't want to be waving flags and having a celebration cake and that kind of thing. Yes, they want to celebrate and mark the end of the war, they feel relieved that it's over, but they don't feel in the mood for a party. Now, we can see in the picture a mass grave. So many people died in the First World War. Uh, it's estimated about a million British soldiers died in the First World War. So, loads and loads of people affected. These soldiers, they're somber, they're sad because they saw the experiences, their friends uh, died perhaps in the war. And as I said, they don't want to party. So the way that people reacted to the end of the war was different. Millions of people in the country, of course, and millions of different reactions to the end of the war. Britain's most famous Prime Minister, he wasn't Prime Minister during the First World War, but he was during the Second World War, he said this at the end of the First World War, and I'll just take a moment for everyone to read that one carefully. I won't read it out loud to all of you, but I think it's quite striking, some quite powerful phrases. The bits that leap out to me, the crippled and mutilated soldiers darken the streets. Crippled and mutilated, well crippled means people can't walk properly, mutilated means their body has been in some way damaged. They darken the streets. The next sentence, every cottage had its <coughs> empty chair. Now, I don't need to explain that, you understand what that means. So it's not just the soldiers who were damaged by the impact of the First World War, as we're about to see. Now, this photograph was taken, the battlefield, uh, the, um, we can see the, uh, the ladies laying the, uh, the cemetery, laying the wreath to, to remember the soldiers who died, their husbands in this case. Now, we know that the cemetery is brand new here because they haven't got the ordinary gravestones that we see now. It's just quite a simple cross at this point. So this is all very fresh in the memory for these ladies. Now, let's just pause for a moment and think about what these ladies have to deal with, the impact of the First World War for them. They've lost the husband that they, that they love. Perhaps they have to bring up the children on their own. That's going to present its own challenges. The grief that they have to deal with, it might get easier and then get worse, then, but it's always going to be with them for the rest of their lives. <coughs> Another photograph of celebration here, but I think as I, the, more I, the more time I spend looking at this picture, yes I can see people happy, waving flags and celebrating, but I can also see, if you look in the eyes, you can see something else as well. The reason why some of the men in this picture are lower down is because they're in a wheelchair. Now today if you go to the cinema, the shopping centre, the leisure centre, there's lots of easier access for people in wheelchairs. But rewind a hundred years and that certainly wasn't the case. And that's why when I look at this picture, you look into the eyes of some of these soldiers who've been made disabled by the First World War. They're smiling but you can see a sense of sadness and uh, a sense of that, they, that their lives are damaged, perhaps ruined, uh, for the rest of their lives. Striking photo, this one. If you look really carefully, you'll spot that all of the people in it have got exactly the same injury. Now, that's not because of some kind of free coincidence that all the soldiers who returned after the war had finished had exactly the same injury. Of course, that didn't happen. But it just tells us that so many people were injured that they could be categorised into groups like this. So in this photograph, we see all the soldiers have lost their left leg from the hip downwards. But in another photograph somewhere else, you might have a group of soldiers who've lost their right leg from the hip downwards. Or pictures of soldiers who've lost their left leg from the knee downwards. So many soldiers were wounded in this horrific way that's going to impact on the rest of their lives in a really significant way that they can be categorised into different groups like this. <coughs> Now this picture I've been showing with some of my year 11 students where we're looking at the progress of medicine over time. What's happened to this soldier is they've suffered a really bad facial injury. 
The eye there, that, that's a fake eye, that's a glass eye. Because of the injuries they've got from the battlefield, that person is blind. <coughs> now, the First World War was a time where reconstructive surgery, and plastic surgery, was being trialled for the first time. So when I click onto the next picture, you'll see what he looked like afterwards. Now you'd say, that looks like quite a good job. Uh, with the glasses on, it kind of hides the scar a little bit, and you can see where there's been a skin graft placed on top of the forehead there to make it kind of smoothed over. But the thing is, what helps, I suppose, us with this, is it's a black and white photo, and it's not particularly high definition at all. If you were walking past this person on the street, you would spot it straight away. Because the skin of that bit there, right in the middle, would be a different colour from the skin of the rest of the face. And that's just something that, as I say, you're walking past someone in the street, you'd notice instantly. And that person there would have to put up with that for the rest of their life. They've got their hor horrific memories of the First World War to deal with, but not only that, they get people staring at them as they walk down the street. Similar to this picture. Again, it's, it's really the reconstructive work that was done, but you can still tell it's not, it's far from perfect, and it's a very long way from what they used to look like. This person has to deal with, uh, as I say, their memories of the First World War, but every time they look in the mirror, a constant reminder of the trauma that they suffered. But a lot of students in the room know that it's not just the, the injuries on the outside of the body that affected people. Here we can see two soldiers whose, whose body wasn't damaged by the First World War. Their bones were broken but their mind was broken instead because of the horrible things that they saw and the experiences that they had to deal with. This soldier here, he's back in Britain. He's in a wheelchair, but not because his legs are damaged, not because his spine is damaged, but because, as I said, his brain is, is kind of broken. He's had a breakdown, so it's, it's as if his brain has told his body not to work anymore. And the sad thing, the extra sad thing, I think, about the gentleman in the wheelchair in this picture is... He's got a wife, and he's got two children. Now, for the ladies in the cemetery on a few pictures earlier, they've got grief to deal with. Their loved one has died in the First World War. But I suppose at least they know that that person has died and they can perhaps move on with their life. It's going to be really difficult. But for the gentleman in the wheelchair there, his wife would go and see him, but he wouldn't move. She'd say, hello, how are you? But he wouldn't reply. And imagine that when the children of that man in the wheelchair, they go and see him and say, hi dad, are you all right? But he just wouldn't reply. How difficult would it be for those children? They haven't got a gravestone and a memory of a hero. They've got someone who doesn't respond, who doesn't recognize them even, who doesn't say anything to them. Impact of the First World War, something that the experience of the First World War has caused for these people. Both these soldiers, they came back but their lives are not the same. And the lives of their loved ones are forever ruined by the experiences of the First World War. So plenty of people did come back to Britain. What do they do? A lot of them went back to do the jobs that they had previously done before the outbreak of the war. Uh, a lot of the soldiers uh, who were suffering mentally with their experiences wouldn't be in a wheelchair like the person in the previous picture. They would go back to work and to look at them, you think, well, there's nothing wrong with them. But then you wouldn't know about when they wake up in the night screaming because of uh, the nightmares and the experiences that they're having to cope with. You wouldn't know about the breakdown in the relationship with their family members because they can't talk about their problems. And it's all of these things that really hit home the true impact of the First World War. There were people who wanted to party and celebrate the end of it all, but other people, they just wanted to try and move on, but they could never move on. It would linger with them forever. And this is where the poppy appeal comes in. The people who make the poppies, the Royal British Legion, they thought they needed to do something to try and help out all of those people who've returned but are suffering after they return. Or all of the people uh, who a family member did return, but they have to try and get on with their lives, and they're finding the grief, the trauma, and the uh, things like that really difficult to get on with. 
This slide I put up every single year. An important reminder about what the poppy is, what it re represents. And some of the other misconceptions about what sometimes people think the poppy is, but it's got nothing to do with. Wearing the poppy is just a symbol to say, I remember the sacrifice uh, and the difficult times that people had to go through in this country. So the people who make the poppies, the Royal British Legion, uh, their slogan over the last few years has been, live on. And with the, the, the money that people uh, donate when they buy a poppy, it, as it says there, it goes to help bereaved families, that's people who've lost a loved one, uh, wounded servicemen and women to live on, uh, to help veterans uh, try and help them find a job, try and find them help, uh, help them to find housing and give them counselling. Uh, and things like that. Now, soldiers who survived the First World War and who came back to Britain, there's none left alive uh, anymore. They all died, uh, they've all died. The last one died a couple of years ago. But of course, the poppy appeal and remembrance is about the First World War, but also conflicts, the Second World War, and much more recent conflicts as well. And just for a moment, I'll tell you about last year's Remembrance Assembly. When I was delivering it to the sixth formers, there was a student in there who then went on to join the British Army. So when I think about Remembrance now, I'm thinking about a student who I taught at Colton Hills from year seven to year 13, who is now in the British Army, and there is a chance that uh, if they get deployed in various countries, that they could be uh, going through some of the difficult times that we've been talking about here. So it brings an extra layer to me when I think about the time thing. So the poppy appeal is really important, and that bit of money that's donated helps to go uh, towards uh, soldiers and families of soldiers who are trying to cope with such difficult things. Now, the poppies uh, are being brought round later on uh, today, uh, and yesterday I was so pleased to see some people wearing them already. Uh, but the most important thing, the reason, as I said, why this year is extra special is on Sunday, Sunday's day, 2018, the 11th of the 11th, it will be exactly 100 years since the end of the First World War. And whether it's on television, or whether you're at a football match, or whether you're at, uh, even in Mary Hill Shopping Centre, I've been there on Remembrance Sunday, and there's been an announcement, and everyone's just stood still for a minute, even in somewhere like Mary Hill Shopping Centre. Everyone just stands still for a minute, just to think about the things that we've been talking through in the Assembly, and to remember the sacrifice made. Okay. So, 11 o'clock on Sunday, just give a moment to think about the things that we've been talking in this uh, assembly. But thank you so much for listening respectfully, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. That's it.